professor Kamila, shall I start now? Yes. Okay. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are. This is a global forum, and uh, people from all. One one minute. One minute. There is some. So uh, again, once again, I should say there was some interruption, so I couldn't complete. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all. And as we know, all, all of us coming from various parts of the globe. So you are in different time zone. And today we have a very important topic that is health and uh, migration, how they're interlinked, and crisis also, health crisis and migration. And the uh, speaker is Professor Kamilat Kigao, who is very familiar to this forum. He has been mentoring students here and also part of the organizing group for various activities. So very familiar, but still I want to introduce briefly. Uh, Professor Kamila is the coordinator of the area, uh, uh, you know, coordinator of the area of integration studies at the Center for Research of North America, which is called CISAN, at National Autonomous University of Mexico. She was previously studied journalism at Utrecht in Holland and Aarhus in Denmark. And she has been visiting faculty to many universities, uh, for, for example, Becker Institute of Public Policy, Rice University, Texas, University of York, Canada, and she has been member of executive committee of the International Migration Section uh, of the Latin American Studies Association, LASA. And uh, she has interest in migration, diaspora communication and diplomacy, entrepreneurship, and many other area on development. And her published book very recently, 2020, uh, titled Discrimination and Privileges of Skilled Migration, the Case of Mexican Professionals in Texas. So these are the very brief introduction about her, but she has extensive work on uh, many areas uh, and she has been organizing very big international conference regularly uh, in the Mexico University and uh, very well read and very well published. So with this brief introduction, I request Professor Camilla to start her talk. Yes, good morning, everyone. And also good night for some of you, most of you, I understand. And uh, thank you, Professor Shahu, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, some of you may know me already because I'm um, I've been uh, correcting your uh, essays for the uh, this course, but um, of course it's uh, very nice to meet you here. So uh, I will uh, talk today about uh, COVID and uh, the impact it has had on migration. I hope you can all see my screen. Okay. Yes, we can see. We can see. Uh, yes. So oh, um, perhaps I will take out my video while I talk so that we have a better sound. Okay. Let's see. Yes, Pai. Um, so uh, health migration, uh, um, health crisis migration and diasporas in the context of COVID-19. I'm sure you all know a lot on this topic. Um, you've heard of um, a lot of evidence about migrants. Um, so today I will just try to, uh, to make a, th a synthesis of uh, what you read and um, 
try to introduce you to some some of the topics that are um, studied now um, in, in migration literature. So I'm going to structure my talk in four parts today. Uh, the first one uh, will try to introduce you to data, what is the impact on migrants and immigrant healthcare workers in some of the countries of destination and origin. Then I'm going to look at related studies, main topics and authors in uh, the literature on COVID and migration. I'm sure some of you are um, interested in, in theoretical uh, studies also. I know some of the people here are working in international organizations, but we'll try to give it a theoretical uh, focus also. The third part is on understanding immobility. It's trying to make sense of the social and political implications of uh, this crisis. And the fourth part uh, will be on um, the political solutions that have been proposed to deal with this crisis, okay? So let's go to the first part. It is called uh, the data in me impact on immigrants and immigrant healthcare, healthcare workers. We have an image here, some of the many that have circulated of a woman seeking asylum at the US-Mexico border. She's been tested for COVID with her child. And of course, we've, we've seen maybe a lot of heartbreaking images of this type. Uh, let me just recall some of the facts that also, you may know the, about the international and internal migrants, some overall data on migration. We had that international migrants are 3.5 of the global population today, and internal migrants are estimated at 9.5% of the global population. Migrant workers represent a big percentages of all workers. They are 20.6 in North America, 17.8 in Northern, Southern and Western Europe. <clears throat> One in five workers in those countries are migrants and may be among the first to be affected by layoffs, movement restrictions and lockdowns. Migrant workers in health critical, uh, critical health sectors have been, of course, um, more affected by this uh, virus because at least 10 countries, if not more, depend on foreign-born workers uh, in healthcare services. Some of these countries, as you may know, are um, United States, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Belgium, the Netherlands, Canada, and Switzerland. For instance, in Switzerland, uh, in 2015-2016, 47%, that is almost a half of the doctors and 32% of the nurses were foreign born. So that is why we are talking of a big impact of COVID-19 on health workers. Now, if we look at countries of immigration, main countries of immigration, such as the US, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Russian Federation. Um, they have big percentages of uh, migrant share that uh, as a, a, a total population, but also some of these we find among the countries that have been most affected by COVID-19. So we have the US in the first graph that I just show you, and um, on this other one that uh, is the most affected country by COVID. So what does it mean? For many uh, people, this meant that migrants were carrying the virus, so that, is, that was dangerous. And uh, for other people, uh, it meant just uh, a better spread uh, in, in um, um, bigger cities such as New York or London. So we will try to give it uh, a meaning in this conference, why does this happen? Of course, the US is also uh, one of the countries that has experienced more health worker deaths. We see um, by December 23, 
421 deaths of healthcare, foreign healthcare workers. Um, the Philippines also has had this problem. But even so, the, the foreign health, health workers are uh, invited to apply for work these days, such as the case of Italy that is depending now on uh, foreign healthcare uh, to deal with the virus. So let's look at the main factors that contribute to the migrants' vulnerability to COVID-19. Um, I am inviting you to, to see this study at Sweet Mahona. Um, they, uh, it's a group of people, they analyze the factors linked to COVID and migration. And they find these main five factors that are um, affecting migrants. Uh, the first one would be precarious working environment and living conditions. The second one is limited access to healthcare, uh, unemployment, bad employment conditions, travel restriction, and xenophobia. I will go through these factors one by one. So let's look at the precar precarious working environment and poor living conditions, which means that uh, migrants and refugees live in temporary shelters, particularly um, low wage migrant workers. The internationally displaced people are also at risk. Um, one proof of this, if we look at, at for instance, at um, rates of immigrant deaths in France and Sweden. Let's compare 2019 with 2020. We see that uh, the blue line for France, light blue one, it almost doubled in 2020 and uh, it's the same situation for Sweden, okay? So uh, this is to show that more migrants are dying uh, these days in the last year. Concerning the limited or no access to healthcare services due to the legal and practical barriers to healthcare exclusion from the national pandemic plans, uh, we look at the example of California. In California, we have uh, uh, big differences among uh, immigrant healthcare and uh, US born. We see that. Uh, for instance, adults, immigrant adults, 16% uh, of them don't have a uh, case for elderly and uh, for children is even higher. This is three times, it's three times higher for children who don't have health insurance in California. However, uh, California has been one of the places that most, pr most protected migrants because they are um, necessary for the local agriculture and industry and uh, many of the cities have come up with plans to help migrant workers during COVID. The third factor would be travel restrictions that led to mass exodus of migrant workers populations, international and internal. We have a map here of the lockdowns um, at uh, the mid of uh, 2020. We see that only some of the places have had partial closures, but um, main countries of destinations or even those that are not normally receiving a lot of migrants close their borders, okay? <clears throat> this is um, a matrix that the IOM has um, constructed. I invite you to see the original on the IOM website when you get the chance. It's a movable matrix. Um, it, it moves each month since uh, March 2020. Um, and it's a very nice picture to get uh, on how the, the, the world is opening and closing, but mainly we see that uh, almost half of the airports today are closed. Uh, so <clears throat> we see in this matrix that major migration destinations from the United States 
a destination for migrants from Central America to Australia, destination for migrants from the Pacific Island to Russia, which is a destination for migrants from Central Asia, have closed their borders to international travelers. In some cases, such as Nepal, significant migrant origins have closed their borders to inter returning migrants. Some countries, including China, have imposed restrictions on travel within countries. At the same time, international and domestic travel options have dwindled. This has left migrants in a variety of challenging situations. Migrants who work in or were planning to work in another location cannot access their jobs, as is occurring with migrants from Tajikistan to Russia, cannot travel home even if they had, have lost their job, as is occurring with migrants from Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, or are struck in transit, as it has occurred with internal migrants in India. And most of you know more because you are from India. Let's go to the economic impact of the pandemic on migrant workers. If we have a look at the year-to-year -year increases in unemployment rates of migrants and native-born in some of the OECD countries, comparing mid-2019 and mid-2020, we see, for instance, that uh, unemployment has grown among migrants uh, almost 7% uh, in the US, 7% um, in Canada, 5% in Spain, 3% in Greece, and so on. Some countries are, however, experiencing um, um, lower unemployment among migrants, maybe because of the necessity created by the pandemic. So this is where uh, the, the migrant workers are becoming, becoming essential workers, as it has been said. Why are migrants uh, more vulnerable? Also because many of them work in, in services sectors, that is hospitality, health, retail trade, security and cleaning services. For instance, 31% of the migrants in Canada work in hospitality sectors and 25% uh, in the US work in hospitality sectors. What does it mean? Because tourism has, has been almost locked down also, they are, of course, many of them unemployed or have been laid out. Health workers are also at special risk. So, um, this is the reason why many migrants are more affected than native. Now, another way to see it is who can work from home. If we look at the share of employed population who can work from home by place of birth, uh, we see that in most of the countries of origin, Switzerland again, the United States, France, um, Austria, Germany, Spain, Italy, they cannot work for, from home in most of the cases compared to the native born, okay? So this means that they, they have to go out and look for a, for a living and they are more exposed to the virus. The fifth factor that I'm going to talk about is increasing xenophobia in migrant population to do, due to importation risks. And um, this has been also called uh, the, the second pandemic, the disinformation pandemics. Um, here is a sample, racism, racism is a pandemic too. Okay, that's what it, the, the poster says. So, just to sum up this part, we have that migrants have been more exposed to job loss uh, and that leads to economic hardship, loss of remittances in migrant families, inability to repay debt incurred to finance migration, loss of em employer provided housing and legal status. They have limited social protections, 
they have a higher risk of disease exposure and transmission due to living and working conditions. They lack resources and travel restrictions may strain these workers. Um, they may not be eligible for certain types of social protection when they are undocumented. Um, they have more health risks uh, than native workers uh, due, to, due to the fact that they may be uh, traveling in large groups, such as the caravans of Central Americans in Mexico. And um, last thing, when they return home, they are, of course, uh, unemployed. They have limited access to social saf safety nets, large debts accumulated to finance migration costs, families that are no longer receiving remittances. So these are the overall problems. This is why some people have said, and I'm quoting here from Renate Held, the regional director of the IOM Austria. She said, no phenomenon has been as affected by humanity's reaction to COVID-19 as migration. Simply put, humans are the main vector for the transmission of the virus. So the mobility aspects of our response had to be factored in from day one. We urgently need the vibrant dynamism of migration to revive our shattered economies and strive for prosperity and root to an equitable and sustainable world. This time, uh, type of um, assessments have also led to a sort of a vaccine diplomacy that is calling for a, um, migrants to be vaccinated first because they are more vulnerable and they are super spreaders. I'll go now to the second part of the presentation, uh, which is um, on related studies, main topics and authors, so that you, you may uh, find for yourself some of the research that has been done. Let's look at this uh, bibliometric analysis on COVID-19 in the context of migration and health. Um, these authors, uh, Swit Mavunan again, they have studied 276 papers that have been published on the topic. 63% of them refer to public health interventions, 54% to disease epidemiology and management, 22% to mobile populations such as tourists and travelers and 13% to specific migrant groups, such as international students, migrant workers, immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. If you look at these numbers, they don't sum up 100% because some of the papers may deal with more than one topic. Okay. These are the keywords that um, are most, most common in these papers. Pneumonia, China, epidemic, outbreak, travel, infection control, transmission, pandemic, surveillance, risk assessment, uh, gender issues, adult, elderly. If we look at the top journals that have been de de dealing with COVID-19 and migration health, we see on top travel medicine and infectious disease, the Journal of Travel Medicine, the Lancet, uh, Eurosurveillance, Lancet Infectious Diseases, Emerging Infectious Diseases, and the British Medical Journal. The authors um, come from China, most of them, United States of America, United Kingdom, India is in the fourth place, Hong Kong, Germany, Italy, Australia, France. There is one study in particular that I would like to show you. These are the authors, Kramer, Chu, Dai Hai He, Paibos, uh, Vibu. And um, I will show you one study in particular of Sir Kechi and Yusuf Sashin 
on coronavirus and migration. Uh, it's called Analysis of Human Mobility and the Spread of COVID-19. They have uh, produced a model on migration and travel intensity that can explain the outbreak and spread of COVID-19. They say the presence of migrant stock populations of Chinese origin and the immigrant stock in China are useful indicators in the prediction of the spread of the outbreak worldwide in the event of interaction with several other macro factors. So what they do is they monitor immigrant stock data and travel volume data based on human mobility corridors, that is, between origins and destinations. And that they conclude that countries could have been better prepared and taken early measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. And they are basing their research on a regression model. There are three types of special diffusion patterns of viruses and contagious diseases. Uh, we have a model of expansion diffusion in the first uh, picture, a relocation diffusion in the second one, and a hierarchical diffusion in the third one. So um, what happens in the case of um, COVID-19? According to the diffusion theory, the increase in emerging infectious diseases is related to environmental change and to human encroachment into remote areas, which increases the contact between human and non-human species, thereby allowing for cross-species transfers of pathogens. Let's look at this fi figure um, from Nadine. They are sh it shows how uh, the virus is transmitted from bat to pangolin, snake, civet cat, camel, and then to human. And this is um, valid for other SARS viruses uh, as well, such as the MERS. Okay. So, uh, Sirkechi and uh, Yusuf Sashin, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that well because they are. Turkish of origin, maybe some, uh, some of you may correct me. Um, they made uh, four clusters of countries uh, to see how the virus could be predicted and could have been predicted, the both things, okay? What they say is, despite some racist exchanges by politicians in early phases of the COVID-19 crisis, the spread of the virus does not have an ethnic origin. We have shown the role of human mobility patterns irrespective of ethnic or national origins. Many other studies by scientists also point that the origin of the viruses have not been confirmed. Given the fact that human settlements and more and more expand into living spaces of animals, there is likely to be more transfers of such viruses from animals to humans. Focusing on this latter challenge may mean better use of our resources and energy for future generations. So in cluster four, we have a lot of countries that are experiencing uh, the COVID-19 crisis badly, that is the US, Belgium, France, Germany, and this is the clustered countries uh, where most travel has been happening, okay? So, why is this uh, research? What does it, uh, what does it mean? Why do we have to know all this? Uh, as, and uh, his uh, co-author, Yusuf Sashin, says disease spread patterns are known to be moderated by human activities ranging from agriculture to conflict. What, what is it useful for? The statistical model of Sirketi and Yusuf Sashin shows that the COVID-19 spread around the world could have been estimated and mapped out to a substantial degree of accuracy by simply taking into account some macro variables, such as the population size, human development index scores, and immigrant stocks 
from the origin at each destination. Where data are available, this model can be used to identify certain regional or local level concentration of infected individuals. Large metropolitan areas in global cities such as London and New York are taking the lion's share of cases in their respective countries. Therefore, further spread from these centers could also be examined using a similar approach. What matters in this model is that viruses relocate to surrounding areas or beyond by transport following the diffusion figure. So, to sum up this second part of my presentation, I will give some key findings in migration and COVID-19 literature. We have, of course, that human mobility has played a central role in the spread of the coronavirus disease. We have limited inclusion of migrant status within data collection practices in routine health information systems, hospital registries, and disease surveillance systems globally. This means, as it had been Previously said in the, it has been previously said in this uh, course on the GCM that we don't have enough data and some hospitals don't register undocumented migrants or documented migrants or migrants at all. They just take the name of the person. So we'll maybe we will not know exactly how migrants have been affected by the virus. We don't have very clear data. Now, a third conclusion is that migration is considered a social determinant of health. Conditions surrounding the migration process can increase the vulnerability to ill health. Differences in disease profiles and health risk factors between migrant and host population are very clear within various migrant categories. And among the migrants themselves, there are more vulnerable categories than others. Those in adverse working conditions with poor access to health service, the low wage and often undocumented, migrant workers in intensive animal rearing and meat processing industries that favor cross-species transmission zoonoses. Um, Okay, uh, I'm not finished, of course, but uh, in case uh, some of you uh, would like to give some comment or have questions on this uh, first part, you are welcome. Just before uh, we continue. They can, they can write on the chat box also, I can see and... Okay. Okay. So please write on the chat box if you have any question and we can carry on the talk. And at the end, we can ask questions. So um, let's so continue then. Continue. Yes, yes, yes. We can continue. Yes. So let's go to the third part of the presentation today, um, which is um, understanding our immobility during COVID. We have uh, an image here on, from the Delta Airlines um, uh, Park in Alabama. And uh, I suppose we can give other thousands of images like this with uh, uh, airplanes uh, stopped somewhere in the world. And this is kind of a sad picture for all of us, okay? Um, so many people have asked, what does this new immobility mean to mobile people such as migrants and diasporas? Um, more than any other metaphor is uh, one of the studies of Bulama. Uh, being locked represents both a temporal and existential state, not, not, not only the definitive loss of the ability to predict the course of the days, 
but also the end of autonomy to move and get things going. Many of the studies have pointed to the social preventing and mandatory isolation uh, as a, a, a control device by the state. This is a, a research by Dinella and Ibanez. It is written in Spanish, but uh, I will give you a strong introduction to this study now for those of you who don't uh, read Spanish. These authors uh, talk about the logic of isolation and mass massive residential human immobilization as a control device where subjects are reduced to isolated beings, denying the social dimension of their existence and proposing an individual salvation in the face of the danger posed by others. They also say and recall that the political powers in many countries always try to empty the streets, and this has been an excellent opportunity to do it. They talk about the culture and discourse of fear that are combined with the logic of otherness as dangerous as an enemy. They explain how during the pandemic, the nationalism and salvationists emerged with intensity in defense and on behalf of many countries. They consider that migrants have been dehumanized because of the vulnerable conditions that I've just explained in the uh, previous parts of my presentation. And finally, they talk about precarious employment, the impossibility of accessing basic rights such as education, health or social security without an ID, the vulnerability of women in the face of sexist violence and sexual exploitation. This is, uh, uh, they talk about women, but we can put other sexual minorities, uh, such as uh, the queer uh, migrants and uh, um, or whatever you, you may think about. Okay. This is what has been written about COVID immobility, but let's look at previous studies on immobility previous to the pandemics. They may be um, a way to understand migrants' conditions today, okay? And um, I am particularly interested in showing you this model of Shuo. He's been working on, um, on a map of the preference to stay. Uh, he's studying um, the immobility of people and why some more people are mobile and some others are, are not interested in moving anywhere in the world. And the black part of this map show people that are not interested in migrating. The light gray, lighter gray areas are where there are more migrants. But uh, you can, um, of course, look at the map and see your own countries or your own regions and reflect about it. Shuo says, there is a mobility bias in migration studies. I'm quoting from his work, a systematic neglect of the causes and consequences of immobility hinders attempts to explain why when and how people migrate. International migrants have long composed only two to four percent of the world population and rough estimates of internal migration suggest an additional 12 percent. Still, despite the off-site statistic that one in seven people are on the move, few scholars ask why in our age of globalization six out of seven are not. He proposes and recalls several terms and concepts to study non-migrants. Non-migrants is a more neutral term. Stayers denotes more agency to non-migrants, that is, those who do not wish to move, and those left behind. Uh, this term has a more normative connotation and often limits studies of immobility to households with a migrant elsewhere. So what he says is some are more in charge of the immobility than others. And some 
feel imprisoned by their immobility. And I think we all say feel imprisoned by our mobil immobility. So that's where I, I come back to Shul to see how he studies immobility in migration study. He asks several questions. Uh, one of them is why, given such great disparities in wealth, opportunity, and security worldwide, do so many people prefer to stay? And he gives some data on the preferences to stay. 81% 80, of the people in China prefer to stay and 91%, according to Shul, prefer to stay in India, even, even though may, they may have to migrate. And also he gives an interesting data on Senegal. He says over 25% of those who did not have enough resources to meet their basic needs also did not desire to migrate. So why do people stay? Okay, they stay because they, there is an aspiration to stay as opposed to the aspiration to migrate. And here is where uh, Schuel proposes an aspiration capability model. Uh, he proves that some migrants become stuck in transit, immobilized before they reach their aspire destination. And he applies this aspiration capability framework across a spectrum of force and voluntary migration. And example of this one is even though many refugees fleeing violence in conflict may ideally aspire to stay in their own country, then they nevertheless prefer to leave, taking all factors into account. In this context, the desire to leave would constitute a migration aspiration. However, only those with enough resources or greater migration capabilities can act upon this aspiration. This distinction between aspiration and capability, I'm quoting, quoting from Shul, helps clarify why the number of internally displaced persons, 40 million in 2016, is nearly double the number of displaced people who cross international borders. It also alerts us to the fact that the most vulnerable may not be able to move at all. As Lukman highlights, those who cannot leave war-torn settings, the displaced in place or involuntarily immobile, remain theoretically invisible in refugee status. This model can also be applied um, in household, household research on migration uh, to understand why some of the people um, migrate and some stay, um, why immobility and mobility are often two sides of the same coin, mutually constitutive and reinforcing. So to sum up on this model, why do people stay in their places of residence? Sometimes because they lack the capability to move, uh, political or legal, uh, because of migration controls. Uh, for instance, um, those of you who know the situation in Cuba or the former Soviet uh, countries, um, the people could not get out of the country. So that was uh, uh, one incapability to move. People don't have economic capabilities, that is, they don't have the financial capital to migrate. They lack social cap uh, capital, that is, um, they don't have networks, they don't know the country they where they would go to. And uh, they are not capable physically to move because of border walls and detention centers. But the work of Schulz also says that some people do not move because they wish to stay. So he talks about the embeddedness and place attachment. The longer someone lives in, in a place, the more economically embedded he or she tends to become 
and the more she or he stands to lose by leaving. And this last consideration explains why on the average there are more young people who migrate than old people, because old people become more embedded places. They don't like to, to leave their houses or their places of where they live or where they were born. Uh, just to get to some optimistic points on immobility, Schur says there is a positive value of immobility as well. That is on the local level, economic investments, opportunities and advantages, as well as the dynamic social life, community engagement and place commitment can be location specific. That is, they would be lost by my life. He opposes this idea of culture of migration that has been widely studied in migration studies to the culture of Spain, which is equally, if not more important. And then uh, to conclude, he says, immobility is a learned social behavior. People learn to stay or to leave. And this is what we see in, uh, in many flows of migration. People uh, learn to leave because some families have left before or friends, or they learn to stay because no one has migrated in their families before. I will come to the fourth part of the presentation, which is COVID-19 and the call for a more human diplomacy. Basically, uh, this part is trying to show you what were the political proposals, what to do for migrants, for people in general during the pandemic. So, um, one of the Political issues has been this disinformation crisis. These are some posters uh, showing um, um, 5G does not cause coronavirus, they say, okay, in Austria. So there is talk of this disinformation crisis. Uh, referring to this uh, intentional and systematic manipulation of information deceiving the target audience to cause public harm, generate profit, and or advance political goals in many countries. The uh, Verité, Viola, and Coops, they find two levels of action at this disinformation crisis on the internal and external uh, levels. But of course, these two are um, intertwined in the globalization and uh, because of social networks. Uh, what they find is that disinformation mainly affects minority groups and thrives in socially unstable environments with vulnerable media ecosystems and countless institutions. And um, they outline the increasingly important role of online regulations, and we've seen a uh, uh, one of these with the canceling the, the Donald Trump's uh, Twitter account, which was not because of the pandemic, but however, we see an increasingly important role of this type of regulation done by companies, which is kind of interesting to see because normally we had this kind of bodies um, at, at the expense of the states, right? What are the implications for our topic, coming to back to our topic, this disinformation crisis? Verity, Biola and Coops, they say health messages that authorities were trying to convey to the public, they get increasingly contested. They show the difficulty to debunk and challenge the premises of the conspiracies without risking to further amplify their message. And they show this fact-based debunking risks uh, elevating their visibility without necessarily undermining their appeal. Here is a, a model that the, the authors propose on the disruptive effect of the 5G conspiracy on Twitter in April 2020. Um, 
they show the main tags stronger together, COVID-19, etc. So um, their study shows that the discursive community promoting the 5G coronavirus conspiracy, which is Browning Network, has matured by April to the point that it reached the same size as that of supporting the quarantine measures, including the EU action, which is purple in the, this figure. From a communication perspective, this has two important consequences. First, it meant that the health messages that the authorities were trying to convey to the public became increasingly contested. And second, it made it difficult for public authorities to debunk and challenge the premises of the conspiracies without risking to further amplify their message. In conclusion, conspiracy theories are embraced by the public, not for their factual value, but for their ability to prove a false sense of reassurance in times of great uncertainty. Fact-based debunking thus risk elevating their visibility without necessarily undermining their appeal. One of the con consequences of the, on the political level has been that the pandemic raised the profile of global health issues and led to their securitization. This revived a discussion over international regulation of biological security through existing and new mechanisms such as the 1972 Biological Weapons Conventions that banned biological agents or toxins that have no justification for peaceful purposes. This uh, convention there have been many proposals to change it, to update. In 2001, a draft protocol to the BWC was developed, aimed at correcting those deficiencies. The protocol would bind states to declare their activities connected to biological agents that could be weaponized. It could also create the organization for the prohibition of bacteriological, biological, and toxin weapons to carry out verification activities, including transparency visits. Finally, the protocol would allow states parties to request investigations of disease outbreaks when biological weapons use could be suspected. However, the protocol was successively rejected by the administrations of Bush and Obama, which, who put the idea to rest. Okay. Um, another topic was the criticism to multilateralism and the World Health Organization. Uh, here is a quote for, from one of the uh, newspapers, um, World Health Organization struggles to prove itself in the face of COVID-19. Now, the discussion about the World Health Organization is, of course, linked directly to the actors who are financing this organization, among which uh, the U.S. is the first followed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK, etc. <clears throat> so, what about the World Health Organization that is of interest for us today? Um, it has come under fire for its initial response and reporting of the pandemic, its acceptance of Chinese self-reporting and management of the crisis, and its dubious claims that it failed to acknowledge and respond to data from Taiwan that indicated human-to-human -human transmission was occurring. And Taiwan, along the way, has been a hot issue in, in discussing the, the World Health Organization critics. Um, the World Health Organization has been criticized for its vulnerability to national and regional political movements um, and uh, also um, the United States has been criticizing the organization of being China's puppet in the words of the 
former president. Um, the, Donald Trump accused it of being uh, too slow to get critical data about the initial outbreak in Wuhan and alert the international community properly because, because it was too sympathetic to China's interest. Others pointed out that the World Health Organization was limited, has limited informant power. Um, and if, so if member states uh, decide to disregard some steps outlined in the 2005 International Health Regulations, this means um, they can do it, okay? This, this uh, International Health Regulations is meant to prevent the in international spread of diseases. <clears throat> some of the solutions. Of course, uh, you may all recall <clears throat> Javier Solana. The former <clears throat> NATO secretary, right? Um, <clears throat> he has written a very interesting uh, piece in the Hague Journal of Diplomacy. I invite you to read it. Uh, he makes the point for um, change in, in um, in the history of diplomacy, he says that uh, diplomacy has been marked by the feudal lords in the Middle Ages, uh, the 19th century, the main actors were empires and power balances. In the 20th century, we dealt with states and corporations and what he proposes for this coming century and further on is that diplomacy should be centered on human beings. Um, One of the, the most interesting ideas that he launches in this um, article, he says, uh, the pandemic has brought us back to basics. The governments are primarily tasked today with preventing mortality and morbidity. Uh, and his idea is that the global government governance requires a revamp. International trade and financial flows are certainly important, but it is time for the globalization to be a lot more than that. Humanity has a shared planet and a shared destiny, of course. Post COVID-19 international institutions should take note of this reality and cooperate to give appropriate answers to today's most significant issues. Uh, diplomacy should thus become human oriented and abandon its state centric premises. This is the idea. And how, how to do this? He proposes four ideas for this uh, new governance system and new globalization. One of them is the increased role for local authorities. Uh, um, cities should play a bigger part in the enforcement of global governance rules, be they COVID related uh, by improving uh, the waste management systems, supporting sustainable food gardens, the inspection of working conditions in factories, uh, acting on migrant issues, etc. Second proposal is the streamlining of civil society's participation. He talks about how grassroots movements, non-governmental organizations and activists already have a role in the government, global governance. And this has been referred to in the previous literature as the new diplomacy, track to diplomacy, uh, etc. After all, says uh, Solana, uh, climate change awareness in 2019 would not have been the same without Greta Thunberg's campaign, but the international uh, institutions should also uh, have a direct communication with civil society. The fourth point, uh, a proposal is the regionalization of initiatives that are best managed regionally. And this includes particularly migration. Um, they say a, a multilateralism uh, cannot always solve uh, particular issues in particular areas. Um, for instance, uh, quoting from Solana, while global recommendations should be considered, it would make little sense to oversee the electrification of railways in Southeast Asia, 
from Geneva or New York City, or to manage internationally without profiting from ASEAN synergies. Fourth and last proposal is the entrenchment of international organizations into the backbone of our global government systems. And here is a very important issue, the importance of science-based solutions. What he says is, quoting, increasingly global science-based depoliticized international organizations should exist for the provision of the global public goods and to prevent beggar thy neighbor policies, which are present even amidst the current pandemic in the form of vaccine nationalism. We need to make sure that channels for constructive diplomatic dialogue never cease to exist and that multilateral organizations and fora are happy, effective and legitimate enough to offer adequate responses to global patterns. Here is one of the initiatives that I found on Global Cities Fund for inclusive pandemic responses. Uh, I invite you to, to learn about this organization MMCC responds to the unmet needs of cities as they support migrants, refugees, and internally displaced people during COVID-19, right? So, coming to the end of the presentation, what can be done? We see that the pandemic has affected migrant and mobile population in multiple ways, and perhaps to a greater extent than to the general population. The unique conditions surrounding the migration process expose migrants, refugees, and internally displaced population to additional health risks. In this pandemic, migrants and mobile populations are one of the most vulnerable populations. Mitigating a global pandemic requires equal access to health services, regardless of migration status or curtailing mobility for non-citizens. Migration health, quoting again from Sid Maroon, is a shared responsibility with public health impacts that extend beyond national boundaries. The pandemic is also um, let us to ask uh, difficult questions. Who should get the vaccine? The most vulnerable or the super spreaders? These are ethical questions that are difficult to answer. Migrants are both. They are vulnerable and super spreaders. But what we, we find is that migration and population mobility must be key to actors to be considered in global health policy interventions concerning the pandemics. Uh, and uh, as Sirkechi and Yusuf Sashins show, in the future, travel information should be used during the early stages of diffusion, not for discrimination purposes, but to prevent the spread of the viruses. And this is because uh, this is useful for uh, upcoming pandemics as well. Um, to sum up, what can be done? What are some policies that have been proposed? Um, expand eligibility for existing safety net programs to migrants. Include migrants in safety net programs. Provide access to free and low cost testing and treatment. Provide food assistance, especially to vulnerable population. Housing, transportation. Um, provide cash grants except to reduce or defer social insurance contributions for employers, provide employment subsidies to, employ to employers, use migration regulations to protect employment, deploy job search, matching and placement services, adjust migration regulations to protect migrants and fill short shortages, uh, launch a COVID-19 responsive public works, launch training programs, leveraging and e-learning where possible, classify remittance service providers as essential services, create instruments to help uh, remittance service providers manage credit and liquidity risks. Some of the, the measures, we can imagine many, many others. This is um, shortly what I, uh, we can 
think about just to open the discussion there are many ways to see this problem uh, i leave here my uh, email and you are of course welcome to give your comment um, in uh, the time that follows this discussion Okay, uh, Professor Kamila, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you have covered a vast range of issues interconnecting with the, you know, COVID, migrant, and other things. It's a very interesting uh, area, and with lots of facts you presented from various, you know, uh, studies. It's very enriching. So now, uh, what we'll do, we'll open this house for a discussion. And we have so many questions in the chat room. So I'll be you know, requesting one by one. Please uh, go ahead, Richard Avery, uh, then uh, Luis, then we have uh, uh, Om Prakash Maji, then Faiz. So please, one by one, you can ask uh, any question. We have also Subir Rana. So please. Uh, you go ahead directly and ask the question. Start with Subir or Richard. One minute, I'll be. Subir, you can ask now. Richard also can ask. I think I made them co-host, so you can ask. Hello, hi. Yes, Subir, you can. Hi, Camelia. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, yeah, very interesting uh, uh, lecture. Uh, but I had a question regarding uh, migration and pandemic, and how these have uh, led to a rise of authoritarianism and totalitarian regimes. And uh, especially in countries, and which is the worrying part, especially in countries which claim themselves to be democratic uh, uh, countries, democratic nations, uh, oldest and biggest uh, democracies of the world. And I'm and, uh, right here, right now I'm speaking about India in particular. So it has led to a lot of uh, ethnic clashes and a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, hate speech, hate crime, uh, so, how do you see it's uh, these things panning out, and how do you see the interconnections between migration, pandemic, and also the rise of uh, uh, right, the new right? Okay, thank you. Very interesting question. Let's recall um, the, the general atmosphere, political atmosphere before the pandemic. Uh -huh. Because we've seen a rise in populism everywhere, uh, right. in, in many countries, right. before the pandemic. So right. this uh, has been a, an, a greater opportunity, the pandemic, to increase yeah. nationalistic uh, uh, hate speech and um, uh, even in democratic countries. We consider the U.S., uh, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, Spain, uh, Germany, Austria, all uh, France, all these countries that were very mm -hmm. famous for their democratic systems were mm -hmm. uh, seeing uh, right-wing parties on the rise. So when mm -hmm. the pandemic comes and people mm -hmm. start to see that uh, migrants, even their own migrants returning mm -hmm. from abroad mm -hmm. are bringing the virus, then they say migrants are guilty. So we should... Uh, avoid Chinese people, avoid the migrants. Yeah. And it has a, a, been an opportunity to further closure borders and to see uh, uh, globalization uh, is not good because it brings uh, the illness and disease. Mm -hmm. So um, I think w what we have to do is uh, to look at the, the positive side of the things. What are these migrants? really uh, uh, contributing to their countries? What, um, what is the, um, their role in the global economy? What uh, the globalization has brought this problem, but also big solutions. The vaccines are done globally. When you look at uh, 
uh, we can look at any vaccine that has been produced now and it's a result of maybe trilateral hybrid co cooperation between two or more countries. So what can be done in communication studies, we say do not repeat the hate speech, but uh, give proofs against it. So mm -hmm. what we can uh, say is uh, what the positive sides, right? Mm -hmm. While not ignoring the other things, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the problems also. So mm -hmm. I would say uh, uh, science-based cooperation is a very good thing that uh, uh, globalization and digital uh, networks have brought to, mm -hmm. to the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. We have questions from uh, Om Prakash Maji and uh, Luis Ujma and Faiz. Please go ahead, Om Hello. Prakash. Hello, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I am from um, India. I have uh, one question. Uh, why were people feel a geno uh, genophobia during, during pandemics? Before pandemics, we like a for for foreigners, but after that, the scenario can be changed. So this is my first question. And second is, how did the disinformation crisis occur during a pandemics? This is a second. Thank you. Um, okay, why do people feel xenophobia? Um, maybe um, if we look at uh, previous uh, studies on discrimination and uh, prejudice, some people um, have shown that we are all prejudiced in some way, right? So um, maybe the answer is uh, when you really find a, a common enemy uh, during the pandemic, when there is crisis and there is fear, then you start trying to, to find a, a guilty person, uh, some, uh, someone guilty, no? It, it's a sort of... Um, a psychological mechanism to show, uh, okay, I found a guilty person that said, this is the, the people we should fight against. And the, the xenophobia is one way to, to um, spread prejudices, uh, but existing, pre-existing ones, all right? Now, uh, when is it reasonable and when is it not reasonable? So some people will say, okay, it's reasonable that uh, in this, it was reasonable that in December 2020, if you met a Chinese person from Wuhan, you should uh, maintain distance because maybe uh, that person could have the virus. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the same situation five months afterwards or two, uh, maybe a year afterwards, it's, it's not reasonable anymore. So. There is reasonable fear and unreasonable. I think xenophobia is something bigger than fear. It's uh, capitalizing on fear. And uh, about the disinformation crisis, you were asking why did this happen? Uh, it happens also because there is a ripe uh, um, environment for it. There is um, a, um, a democratization of the diplomatic channels, we, we've all become in, involved, we can all become involved in political issues now. So people are trying uh, to, they are all, um, so to say, uh, seeking justice. Everybody's seeking justice. So they, they say, uh, or they, they are seeking um, um, to get their version of the truth. So the pandemic, uh, where is again, fear, uh, they try to help and they try to help in their own way. Some people are, are wrong, but they still they try to help. So uh, I, don't, I don't see uh, always a bad intention in uh, um, spreading disinformation, disinformed messages or bad messages, but uh, that some people don't know a lot, uh, still they want to share what they know. That's, that's my... Uh, hey. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. My view. Yeah. Yes, Nagot. Yes. Louis. That is yes. Louis. Okay. Louis, yes. Yeah. Good day. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a PhD student from University of Nigeria. My question is how can COVID impact mobility 
within uh, regional organizations such as uh, ASEAN, ECOWAS, and uh, the USMCA. Thank you. Well, it impacts mobility uh, inside countries. It impacts mobility on the regional level, on, on the international level. Uh, why so? Because uh, most of the people are locked down. There is a physical uh, barrier to, to people moving anywhere. So uh, uh, myself here in Mexico, we are locked down again uh, and um, uh, locked up. There's the second locked up. Uh, second the national emergency we don't go to the supermarket even most of us so uh, it happens uh, locally nationally regionally uh, it's um, it's kind of a uh, the logic of the pandemics and uh, uh, with this idea that um, uh, locking people would would help uh, not spreading the pandemics now wh what I uh, I see is also that in many cases, this lockdown happens and this immobility happens because people don't like to take the measures to, to defend themselves or get the, the virus themselves and the other people. So if I go out in the street here in Mexico City, I see half of the people without a mask. Now, if they were, maybe if they wear a mask, we wouldn't be all locked up. So, um, uh, uh, maybe the, the solution would be uh, being, uh, so to say, less democratic and uh, 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 putting fines on people who don't wear masks, uh, you know, uh, having um, tougher measures for the virus. Even some researchers ha have said, uh, if we all wear masks, we will uh, reduce the virus and or maybe detain it in two, uh, two months. Uh, I don't know if this is certain, but anyway, I, um, I think uh, this um, immobility is a consequence of our rebellion, so to say, right? And it, it's also a gender issue uh, in many countries. If you look at the people who don't wear masks, some of them are men. Most of them are men in, in the country where I live now. So this is an interesting issue to, to study, right? Thanks. Okay, so we have a question from Faiz and comments from Perry and Dr. Raj Bardhuli. So anyone can go, come, go ahead. Perry, you can come fast if you are there. Sarah, let's let let's uh, let uh, Dr. Raj go first. That's okay, 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 okay. Dr. Raj, are you there? Yeah, I'm yes. trying to unmute. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, hi, good. Greetings to all. And I have to start off by saying uh, that uh, Professor Camellia, your presentation is not only lucid, comprehensive, detailed, but it has just opened up a whole vista of inquiries and research which needs to be done further. So it's actually very, very, very comprehensive and, and, and very logical. And I think some of these messages perhaps could be shared with policymakers. Um, I'll just focus on, because you have explained how mobility and the virus, how virus is as a result of the mobility, whether it's human mobility and human interfering with the environment, that means again, human mobility. So if that is the case, that the virus has spread because of human mobility and migrants are the people who, who move, okay, and who are more vulnerable, and here, therefore they become a scapegoat. See, somebody had asked this uh, question earlier on. Um, I mean, why xenophobia? Why uh, migrants? If migrants, if the message is that since migrants are the ones who are moving more frequently from one country to another, or one space to another, and they are carrying virus, and hence lockdown is suggestive of the fact that movement should be controlled and that people should stay at home. Now, this has very serious implications from many points of view. Firstly, if we come to the conclusion that migrants who are 
mobile, mobile population and the virus is connected to mobility. Therefore, I am not coming to a conclusion, but therefore that mobility, they have to be controlled and they have to be either sent back and spread the virus somewhere else, which means they don't understand the border control people and the immigration authorities don't understand that is the mobility. It's not like pushing one migrant to another area so you can save yourself. No, it is a global situation. So I think there are lots of clear messages for policymakers. And I'm just wondering how the messages could be portrayed starting at the local level, regional level, national, global level, and so forth. So I am addressing more to the policy implications of what you have shared with us. And I think it's very, very um, scientific. Your analysis is fairly logical and it makes sense. Now, the other part is the implications, future implication for future migration. In other words, if this is the source of the problem, which wasn't the case in when it started, it started because humans have been encroaching upon the environment and therefore we are uh, messing around with the animal habitat with uh, uh, people with crowdedness and a whole lot of. So there is this whole issue of the sustainability of the environment and how it affects um, uh, our, our health. Um, and, and okay, so I stopped there and I have just one more observation, which I like very much, the human diplomacy. So everything, the, the 21st century is not like the 19th century was the century of the empires, empire building. 20th century is the century of the corporations. And I quite agree with you. And I think the 21st century has to be the century of humanism as of a great Zambian leader, Dr. Kaunda said, humanism, that, that, that was ages ago, 50, 60 years ago. Um, Paddy will know. Uh, because Paddy's from Zambia, but those of you who have read uh, some of the history of African uh, nations, that humanism or humanity becomes therefore a key factor because everything affects and is affected by people or by humanity. So, so what does that mean, the human diplomacy? Uh, I think some of you now know that countries that have developed the vaccine against this uh, to fight the virus. They're more concerned about how to vaccinate their population. And again, not thinking that your population, once vaccinated, is not going to stop the global problem. The global problem has to be solved through global efforts and global initiatives. And I think here I see a role of human diplomacy in providing vaccines. And I have read somewhere that India has decided to send some vaccines free of charge to its neighboring countries, Bangladesh, Myanmar, um, I don't know, a couple of other countries, and Nepal and so on, including my own country, uh, Dominica. The, uh, the prime minister of Dominica has requested, because it's a small country, 70,000 70, vaccines to be shipped so they can solve their problem. So, human diplomacy in terms of the vaccine diplomacy. I think the vaccine diplomacy is an area which perhaps needs to be a little bit more uh, addressed by other policymakers. And perhaps uh, when the countries that are producing the vaccines may need to put aside X amount to share with other neighboring countries because this is a global. So it's not a, not a question. It's basically comments. The only question is the implications for migrants, future migrants, if this is how we see mobility and not only the Corona-19 virus, future viruses and future health problems. Thank you very much, Professor Camellia. And I'm sorry, I've taken up more time than I should have. Um, so I will stop here. Thank you so much, Mafinki. Um, you've taken enough time. It's been very en enriching your comments. And um, well, I'll try to sort of answer back to some of them. Um, you see, uh, the, 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 about this idea of migrants being scapegoats, I like to use the term of uh, mobility in my uh, uh, presentation because mobility is bigger than uh, migrants. It involves tourism, it involves global trade, people move for a variety of reasons. 
and we have all, we are already there. We are, uh, nobody is asking why people move for global trade, but we do ask why should we, we, we do have some political, uh, um, uh, so to say, proposals to control migrants. So we shouldn't control migrants if we don't, why should we control people, uh, but we don't control trade. So this is a, a paradox that is there in the uh, economic literature. Uh, it has been there for a lot of time. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, the movement should be controlled uh, in general, and I, I don't see it as a solution in the future. I see it uh, as a short-term solution when the, where there are no others. So um, we should distinguish then between moments of crisis and moments of normality whenever that will happen again. And I'm returning to this... Um, uh, idea of diplomacy and of crisis diplomacy. Uh, we, we've had these um, ideas that crisis, uh, we were living in a permanent state of crisis. So, um, and this was before the pandemic as well. Because of people are more aware of the problems internationally, we, and I put a, a very uh, um, simple example, we read the news and we become worried about something. And maybe this thing that is, I'm becoming worried about is not here in Mexico City, it is in Australia. And I'm, I'm becoming worried about the, the forest fires in Australia, but I, I, and this makes me live in a permanent crisis. So this is um, what uh, globalization and networks has brought us to. And it has become more um, apparent during the pandemic. We are more aware of it. So um, I think maybe the, the, the solution to this disinformation crisis, maybe uh, people should become wiser, should take distance from, from problems. What is, um, uh, as in the older communication laws, we were used to be, before we used to be worried about things that are more, uh, uh, to our proximity, temporal proximity, space proximity. We used to be worried about things that happen near to us and, and more recent uh, problems. And today we're worried about everything. And this shaked state of mind that some people have studied is not good for the, uh, um, for the global state of mind if there is a global psychology. Now, um, regarding vaccine diplo diplomacy is also um, a very interesting issue. There are studies, um, one interesting one is by Grisset, uh, saying um, <clears throat> it, uh, this uh, author Grisset recalls how vaccine diplomacy is a, a sort of an innovation diplomacy a sort of a way to see which countries are better at science and technology, which countries invest more. It's sort of a public diplomacy also because it, it um, uh, promotes some countries. But of course, um, it, it poses major challenges um, in, uh, in, the, in the sense that we need to make uh, alliances to transcend this uh, national antagonism or cultural differences to deal with global issues such as the environment, uh, migration, health, and other issues. So, thank you, Dr. Raj. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So, can we go for uh, another question by Patty? I think she has some observation. Peggy? Uh, Professor Camelia, I think I, I would just very much echo what um, Professor Raj has just pointed out in terms of how elaborate your, your presentation uh, has been. And, and my internet connection was, was bad, but I managed to, you know, to be zooming in and out of the room. And, and, and I'm glad that I listened to the, to the very, um, you know, to the last part of it more, more clearly. I really liked how you brought out this issue of the sort of communication and you know I, I'm even thinking that it is a miscommunication crisis that is even um, and what you've just explained now leading us to uh, 
to, to be in this state of constant stress at the individual level. And somehow um, uh, the politics of it is that uh, politicians are aware how much fear uh, they can also instill uh, with miscommunication. Um, and I think before we used to, you know, before the pandemic, I felt that um, it, it, it was, it's always sort of been there, the use, uh, you know, the, 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 the scapegoatism in, 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 you know, in the, in the concept of, of people who are on the move. Uh, in this case, you know, people who are moving from one place to another. Uh, and I like that you pack it in, in the concept of mobility rather than just looking at migration. Um, and thinking that they out there are the ones who bring what we, what we don't desire in our society. Um, and whatever we find is undesirable, we can always point to them and not really to us and what we are doing. Um, and therefore, and also because we haven't had so much evidence, I think uh, over, over the years, I think it's in the, you know, it, it's, it's like migration experts, I think have been bombarding at this store, isn't it? In terms of trying to say, can we look at the contribution of migrants? Can we understand what mobility brings for us? Can we, can we turn the, the angle? Can we look at this in another angle so that we, uh, it, can, it can shape also public discourse? But I think what has happened is that the miscommunication uh, uh, is the one that has always taken over because it's, 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 it's an easy thing for, 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 for politicians to use uh, and it's an easy thing um, to point at because it looks very different and, and so do migrants. They are different from nationals uh, in, in, in many ways. And we continue to propagate this difference uh, also in the way we will provide the access um, to the public services that we have. So we determine who makes public. Um, and in the pandemic, what I think that has done is that the notion of public is everybody who is sitting in a society. And the pandemic doesn't discriminate um, as, as, as it has been said commonly, who is the public? In fact, the pandemic has shown us that we are all the public, we're all part of it. So it will not discriminate. It has, you know, the pandemic has touched the queen uh, as much as, you know, Obama has been, um, uh, Trump has been, uh, he got, he was, he was positive. We've lost, uh, you know, in, in, I was just looking at reports in Zimbabwe, several ministers have been admitted quite critically um, in, this, in this sort of second wave that is, that is sweeping. Um, and many people are affected, but many people have been affected by, by, by different types of pandemic and we haven't seen that scale. So I wonder whether, you know, it, the, the pandemic has also done something about communicating the right messages. It's as though Twitter came alive. It's as though social media also came alive to bring out news we wouldn't know. Um, I also wondered whether, you know, it, it is obvious that, you know, I, I remember sitting one day and watching in while the president of South Africa was having an internal meeting with SADC presidents um, on managing the crisis when, when, when it broke out in South Africa. Because I think at some point he realized that he couldn't leave it. I mean, South Africa is not a member of SADC. He couldn't leave it to SADC to decide and convene. And in fact, the SADC president, uh, who is the president of Tanzania, was not going to convene the meeting. So he took it upon himself to call the neighboring countries of South Africa, and of course, essentially it became SADC countries, um, even though it was not a SADC meeting itself, to discuss the pandemic. And we could watch this. We could watch this as the world. Which day in our lives has it happened, except maybe to watch parliamentarians fighting and deliberating? Have we seen presidents walking into a room and also making Zoom mistakes like we do? you know, in our own meetings and sort of laughing and say, please, Mr. President, could you mute your mic uh, because we cannot hear the other person and them deliberating. So I think it also opened a part of our eyes and our world to see that these are human beings. And it brings me sort of to this humanism um, that Dr. Raj brought into the conversation as well. This empathy, which I, I like how you've reacted to it at the same time that while we try to be more human, while we try to be more empathetic, there needs to be a control of what I can control in my environment and what, in terms of what I see and the communication and the information that comes to me. What can I do within my immediate space to protect my family, to protect my community? But also then, who is in my community, you know? Um, so I was hoping that maybe you could, uh, you know, do, do you think that uh, the discourse around uh, communication, uh, people who provide us information, will, will we see them having a much more important role? Because we've seen how it's been important for us to see for ourselves presidents and and other people engaging in forum where we would never have previewed to enter these conference rooms and, and meeting rooms. Do you think that we, you know, post pandemic will begin to have a much more interest, but uh, find a way to adjust to the stress and the fears that it brings to our everyday lives 
so much that we really use evidence um, to support our personal notions of what migration looks like and what migration means to us in our own societies, in our countries, uh, and even for those of us who are migrants, what it means for us in terms of the contributions we do uh, at home as well. Thank you. Thank you both. It's really nice to, to hear your comments. And well, you've given me a lot of ideas. <laughs> I will try to, to comment on, on some of the issues, right? Um, I see uh, that this digital diplomacy that uh, has been there uh, also uh, since a lot of years and has been um, opposed to traditional diplomacy, to secrecy, we are uh, becoming more democratized in, on in, in general. So I see uh, personal leaders uh, maybe stronger, but uh, in general, I see people taking a, a bigger role in international relations. So I see international discourse uh, broadening itself. We are part of it. And this is a nice issue for uh, international, a nice part of how um, uh, the politics are being carried out in general. Now I'm remembering uh, this, um, um, also this call for uh, a bigger empathy uh, during the uh, international crisis and in general the call for empathy, cognitive empathy, effective empathy. And uh, we have a, a very interesting, um, uh, you know, um, field in international relations that it has been very little explored, which is uh, the role of hormones in and uh, the, the biology of international relations. So the importance is that people meet, they see each other face to face. You know, this is really important for taking decisions. When people really try to see each other, they are more emp empathetic. They are understanding the others. Now, of course, we cannot see each other physically in the pandemic, but we can see how other people suffer, uh, even uh, to a degree that uh, has been called uh, sentimentalism in communication studies that we we see uh, by migration studies that we see um, media uh, with uh, these images of women carrying kids and then we become more aware of asylum seekers and uh, we are empathetic with them. So there is a, a field of opportunity I would say uh, in this sense and um, there was also this idea of what to do for migrants, you know, what to do to so that they are uh, they are cease to be scapegoats. And uh, what we need to do is to show this um, the importance of uh, migrants deprovincializing the, our world. We become uh, more uh, we we mediate between cultures. We migrants. I'm a migrant. Uh, you also, you're living in a different country. So we become uh, sort of cultural translators between our, uh, our words. Uh, in, in general, uh, people like to see migrants. Uh, many people like to interact with them. The problem is when they see, uh, they feel they compete with them. But it, um, it, it is an interesting issue for many uh, people interacting with, uh, having a cultural interaction with people from other parts. So um, we have to recall all, all, all these um, um, contributions of migrants, the hybridization, what migrants bring to science. There are, uh, there are fields of uh, human research or um, a scientific research that are uh, uh, mostly carried out by migrants. So this is uh, what we have to show nowadays also. So, okay. I hope I answered. <laughs> uh, so nice. It's very interesting. In fact, COVID-19, if we see, it brought lots of crisis into the forefront. And it brought, uh, you know, uh, both sides. It also exposed the lifestyle of human being, the climate issues, and the food habit, social life, everything. Certain people with their social 
lifestyle they could overcome easily than other people. So, so many things and Professor Camilla brought lots of information, comparative perspective uh, to this uh, debate and it has lots of takeaway to the policy. I think uh, <clears throat> one good thing I, what I observed in COVID-19 is uh, people are very sensitive about data now. Before that, uh, even no, people do not know how many people are dying, coming, you know, all those things. But with COVID, each number counted so much. And it is globally, locally, so much connected. And it brought the release from SARS to COVID. If you see, people are now more, these diseases became more global in terms of the, you know, the space it taken, in terms of uh, discourse. And it is in the imagination of people that uh, any disease like this, it became a global, uh, you know, a thought process now. So it brought together in one side. It also exposed the humanity, you know, how people are fighting with each other, xenophobia and all. It also brought the good side, how to handle the crisis. I hope with this uh, kind of experiment crisis, we should learn and think ahead because as uh, Dr. Raj Bordali mentioned, also you also mentioned in your human diplomacy should take uh, forefront now because this is the only time we can, uh, this is the only method we can actually connect to other human beings and overcome any crisis. So with this, I thank Professor Camellia for a very wonderful, thought-provoking, informative talk. I also thank all the students uh, who have participated very eagerly listening. I think still we have 72, which is, I think they are so much interested in your talk there, we didn't have drop out. And uh, Dr. Raj Bordali, Paddy, and all others to make this uh, discussion so lively and uh, giving further input. So thank you all. We'll be sharing this PPT with you um, soon after the talk. And thank you, Professor Kamalia, once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.